Society, I want to welcome you. We have a great presentation tonight. Uh, yeah. We're going to be talking about the genetic uh, civil uh, uh, conservation courses. So, uh, and then we're going to start presentation. Uh, we have a, we'll have a short business meeting of the members of the National Historical Society. Okay. And I'll follow up with what we'll do. We'll, uh, I'm on it. No, no, no. Okay. I'm going to turn it in. Now I, I was talking to the whole mic. I said, just tell me when to end it, because otherwise I've got so many stories to go. I'll be here till 12 o'clock midnight. So Mike gives me the, the signal. Am I loud enough? No. No. Oh, I better hide here. Okay. Hello? Oh, Is that better? I'm originally from around uh, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Anybody from Pennsylvania here? No Pennsylvanians? And then I went to King's College. Uh, my grandfathers were coal miners you know, to northeastern Pennsylvania. And uh, so I was lucky. They came from Slovakia and Lithuania. So they had to be like the other immigrants through all the terrible jobs. And I was glad to hear on the news too, I think they're down from three or 500,000 coal miners to just 50,000. So uh, it's just not a thing that we should have men going down into the mines and then polluting the earth with all that acid rain and dust and so I'm lucky uh, my parents saved money uh, I w uh, was a teacher and I couldn't afford it but uh, I wanted to be go green so I've got a house on Lake Poconapog with solar power makes the electricity to power the geothermal to take the the heat out of the earth to heat us in the winter and we put the heat into the ground and in the summer it cools our house. So my electric bill is $19 a month. So there are more jobs today with doing green than with oil, natural gas, or coal. So that's the thing of the future and that's all I have to tell you. Politics. Go green. <laughs> Go green and save the earth. Uh, so I went to uh, uh, New Jersey and I taught fourth grade. I, had, I was a social studies teacher like this gentleman here, but couldn't get a job because you had to pay the politicians in uh, Pennsylvania to get a job teaching. You know, politics. So there they're dying for teachers. And uh, they named all the schools after astronauts in the 60s and 70s. And my school later on was called Jonas Salk Middle School. So I got to even meet Jonas Salk, who you know, invented the polio vaccine. So I was very lucky to, uh, to meet him. And I taught fourth grade and seventh and eighth grade history. And what history level did you teach? Almost anything in high school. High school, okay. And uh, any other teachers here? Only one teacher, two teachers, okay. And then uh, what did I do next? Oh, then I decided to get a master's. And I figured the most important subject is what? English. Reading. <laughs> if you can't read, you can't do any of that. Okay, so I got a master's in reading. Then I did remedial reading and met my wife, whose father originally was from Middlefield, uh, near Middletown, and he was a dairy farmer, and uh, he went to uh, Connecticut, and he had Dutchess County, you know, around Dutchess County, a place called Pine Plains, and Rhinebeck, around that area, and then when I met her, he had a farm in Omico, Rhode Island. You know where it is? Onico, it's near the Rhode Island border. Sterling, Plainfield, and where? 
Oregon's. Okay. So uh, I got to do farm chores there, and then we decided we didn't want to live in New Jersey, so we got a job in the Catskill Mountains, and the western part near a town called Oneonta, uh, where Hartwick College is, and the town where I was in Delhi. So we raised our three kids on an old dairy farm right on the Delaware River, and I used to teach reading, and I used to I went to parochial schools. I don't know if any of you kids went to parochial schools with uh, nuns, and there were books like we have today. You know, you just read one book the whole year. Do you remember that? You'd read one story a day. Yeah. How are you supposed to love reading? You know? Uh, so uh, I decided to invite authors to come to my school. So I would just call them up and say, like to Eric Carl, you know, the, the hungry caterpillar, hey, would you like to come to our school? We don't have money, you know, turn the kids on three. He came, stayed at our house, I made breakfast for him, and my daughter sat on his lap, and he read the hungry caterpillar to her. Uh, I had um, Howard Koch from, I was close to Woodstock. He wrote the movie Casablanca, he won the Academy Award in 43. Here he is standing in our library telling the kids. He grew up, when he was, uh, McCarthy was the uh, senator, you know, when they told the people, you know, that everybody's a communist, you know, if, if you didn't believe what he was saying. So Howard Koch, who was blackballed by McCarthy, he had to go to England to write under a pen name. And what he did is, he said, told the kids, he said, if you believe in something and the whole world is against you, stand up for what you think is right. What do you think of that, Phyllis? And I'm like, oh my God, this guy was 87 years old. Won the Academy Award, you know? And he's telling these kids, I, I don't know if they ever remember, but I did this for 25 years. Had authors stay at my house. Claire B., I don't know if you ever heard of him. He's the guy that, uh, LIU, and he was the one who uh, brought the three-second rule into the uh, NBA. He's in the Springfield Hall of Fame. This guy was 84 years old. He took off his jacket and he's on the basketball court explaining all this stuff, you know, when he used to play with the peach basket and all that. And then the kids are sitting in the gym, and we didn't have bells, so they went through two periods. And these kids just kept sitting and listening to him. They never went to the next class, and this one teacher was mad because they didn't come to class because the kids were so interesting. So these are the crazy things I used to do to turn the kids on. Anybody watch 60 Minutes? Did you see, or was it 60 Minutes, or about The Outsiders? The book The Outsiders? Yeah. It was the 50th anniversary, and that was a book that I used to use in my reading class just to get the kids into reading. So it just hit its 50th anniversary and have the kids even act out the place. So all of a sudden, so here I am with all these authors staying at my house and uh, a guy asked me, you know, do you want to write a book? You know, and I said, sure. So next, oh, next, what did I do with the thing? I can't believe this. So I told the publisher about it, 
And that's what he said, Marty, 10 years later, uh, he said, Marty, they're trying to save the towers. How would you like to write a book? Now, what happened in Connecticut Spire Towers? I think there's only three left. Is that right, uh, Ed? No, it's Jerry. Jerry, okay, sorry. So, here is, let's see if I could find this. There's a little Delhi. Okay, here are the Catskill, or Catskill Mountains. And then I said, I'm going to do go up to the Adirondacks. How many go to the Adirondacks? Okay. So it was a two-hour drive just to get to here. And then I started giving talks all around here, gathering the stories about the 57 towers up there. Okay. And interviewing the people. And let's see if I get this right. So then I was lucky to get one, two, three books done. So then I tried to think, somebody gave me these pictures about the CCCs and the Adirondacks. So I went from the men and women who were protecting the forest from fires to now the men who built up our forest. And I think we don't have any CCC boys here, but we do have Joan. Joan, her father was in the CCC. You want to tell them about that? <laughs> Gary, Gary will tell them. Uh, my father in law served in the CCCs in uh, the beginning of uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps in the early 30s. Can you hear me or you want a microphone? You better take the microphone. Well, just, you can't go too far. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, he served, he was from uh, Springfield in Chicopee, Massachusetts, and he served up in uh, Camp Monroe, which was up uh, near Greylock, up in the northern corner of Massachusetts, between uh, Greenfield and the New York Line in Vermont. So uh, we got interested in it just recently. We found some old photographs of him. I got Marty's book, went through it, and I was very interested in this also because I was trained as a professional forester and many years ago I kind of worked in that field for a while so I got, got far afield from that but that's what I have to say about the CCC and why we're here tonight. Nice <laughs> trip. I got it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks you guys. Where did you go to? Wanakina? No, no, Paul Smith's. Paul Smith's. Paul Smith's College. Okay. So I got my fourth book done. It's not too bad for a terrible student. Um, you always, if you're persistent and you have an editor, that's all you need, and you can write books. If you have a passion, now I have a passion, I'm working on my ninth, 10th, and 11th book. Because I used to have writers come to the, my school, and then I couldn't understand how somebody could be working on three books at once. And I still don't know I'm doing three, but I, I'm, I'm trying. Uh, but I did grow up in the Depression. I was born in 43, and, uh, but it was rough. Anybody have any stories about their parents growing up, how rough it was? But my mother's uh, father was a coal miner. When she was just eight years old, he died. So my grandmother had to raise eight girls and one boy. The older girls, they worked in the silk mill and got 10 cents an hour. You had to quit school. And a lot of the boys, during the, during the 30s, that's what they did. They only had eighth grade education or up to sixth grade because they had to help find some kind of jobs, working on farms, okay? Uh, mowing lawns, shoveling snow, so this is what it looked like. And when Roosevelt was elected, he promised to start the Civilian Conservation Corps. Simple work, more important, however, than the material gains be the moral and spiritual value of such work. He saw that the United States was in really bad shape. Our Northeast, the northern part, uh, Minnesota, we had a lot of fires. The trains were going by, the forest. <coughs> The loggers, they just cut the trees down, left the tops, 
It was just tinder, you know, just ready to burst into flames with the sparks from the trains. Uh, the Midwest, where our gentleman back there from Kansas, where is he? What's your first name? Bob. Bob. Uh, do you remember any stories? Your my, my mother was born in 1922, and she she's still alive today. But her there were ten kids in her family. And Ten kids in the family, I'm just for the... And, and the, the, the picture in the top right is roughly what it looked like in Kansas where she is. Wow. She, at the age of 10, would go and live with other people. His mother at the age of 10 would go and live with other people. And do their dishes and cook for them and do their laundry and all Cook. That. Clean. Just because her father didn't make enough money to support all the kids yet. Because they had ten kids in the family. <coughs> it was it was rough. Okay? And a lot of our boys from Connecticut went to Colorado. And uh, your dad or your uncle went to Colorado. On my mom's side. Okay. My uncles went to Colorado. And her dad worked. Dad ended up working on the WPA. Yeah, building roads on the WPA. Yeah. So Roosevelt was, he knew these people needed jobs. Give them work, okay? Not the free handout like they get today. Sitting on their, you know what, the dupas, and uh, just collect the checks. Uh, and then, so. They went to Colorado and the Rocky Mountains there and helped the ranchers. They also helped uh, the farmers in the Midwest and uh, building up a lot of the uh, uh, national parks in the western part. And he proposed, he went to Congress on, get this pointer, March 27th with the Emergency Conservation Work Act. Three days later, four days later, it passed the House and the Senate. What are you laughing about back there? Ancient history. Ancient history. They don't know how to sit and make bargains. Okay? Uh, you have to give a little and take a little, right? And our Congress today, for how many years now, just not doing anything. Okay? And we need work. And he wanted 250,000 boys in camps by July 1st. Now, how many states were there in 1933? Come on, Jerry, what is it? I wasn't even born. <laughs> Come on, Jerry, did you go to school? How many states were there? I think one that was going. Thirty-eight. The social studies teacher says. Is that correct? <laughs> we're going to give a test after this. Okay, Mike. Bill, Bill, run him off on the mimeograph machine. Where's Bill? There he is. Uh, so, believe it or not, who is who could mobilize? 250,000 boys in the 48 states plus what six places besides the 48 states? Who could tell me? Alaska. Alaska. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Hawaii. 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 No. <laughs> the Virgin Islands. Name the three Virgin Islands. St. Thomas. St. Croix. St. John. Okay. And I went to St. Croix. I went to a little museum. I said, was there a CCC here? He said, yes. We planted, they planted mahogany trees, built roads, and also state parks. I went to Puerto Rico. How many have been to Puerto Rico? How many have been up to the rainforest? El Yunque. You know that serpentine road going up? The, the different recreation buildings, guess who built them? The CCC. The CCC. Get the goosebumps, they're thinking about that. Okay? Now I was just reading in my CCC Legacy, 
Jerry just joined the CCC Legacy, got the newspapers, and you've got the new one, hold it up there. So anybody who wants one of these newspapers, uh, maybe Joan and Gary, and also our FedEx man, what's your first name? Bob. Did you know Bob ran the whole FedEx operation here at the airport? Now, whatever, remember those complaints you had about late deliveries, packages stolen. I ran FedEx freight. <laughs> <laughs> so they had them all these places, but what I was saying, Alaska, what they were doing, one of the projects was building, making totem poles. They were decaying. The, uh, the missionaries came and said, you can't believe in all this stuff. So they were you know, destroying them, all these uh, customs and everything, and the CCC boys jotted down the stories, etc., of the totems. They helped rebuild them. I never knew that in the, in the 30s. Okay, now i got to keep going. Don't forget, keep me on task. Uh, okay, we went there. Okay, he chose the army because the army could feed them, clothe them, give them shelter, medical care, and educate them. All of those things, that's what they did, uh, the CCCs. The Labor Department, they were the ones who were going to select the boys here in Enfield. Uh, how many boys they were allotted. Everything was with population. Yes? I don't remember about how many, but I do remember the boys that I knew. Did you know some boys? Oh, yes. I was born in 1924. Oh, okay. Right. So, I, uh, they really uh, trained these CC boys, the basic uh, training for the army because when they decided to get the army going on the draft, all the CC boys were sergeants right off the bat. Right. They they knew how to make their beds. Yeah. They knew how to run mess you know, the mess mess hall. They were a lot of these boys moved from just being a uh, enrollee to being mess sergeants, yeah. okay? Driving trucks. Uh, typing, uh, you know, also first aid, uh, all these things. Very good. Any of these guys still alive, you know? Do you know any CCC boys? The guys that I know are 94 to 102. So I just started my book two years ago on Rhode Island. In December, I went to this guy's house in Coventry, Rhode Island. He's 97 and got his story. Later on, he even worked with Werner von Braun, you know, on the missiles, you know, after that. But see, he stayed, he was trained by the Army, he went into the Army, and he, he stayed with his whole career in the Army. Thank you. You're talking about the one book point over here? Yeah. I went to the state school. We had three grades on each floor. No. Uh, English class. She, the teacher, gave us English by reading the stories from the book that I keep saying. One book a year and a paragraph every day for English classes. This gentleman read the first paragraph. She read the second paragraph. Mike is counting one, two, three, four, five. He's looking at the sixth paragraph to see if he knew all the words, so that when it got to be that sixth paragraph, he'd be able to read the whole thing. Okay, but things have changed. Okay, thank God. Okay, so there they were, going off, and they would get physical exams, look how thin they were. These boys were sometimes lucky if they had a meal a day. Uh, the army transported them to different parts of Connecticut, some boys went to Colorado, Vermont, New Hampshire. Some boys I even interviewed 
away from Rhode Island. They went to Maine. Uh, they were given army uniforms, clothing, sorry, from World War I. They had to clothe 250,000 people, men, in all these areas within two months. It was, it was unbelievable. And later on, Roosevelt saw how terrible they were. So I think it was around 38 or 39, they all had nice dress uniforms. So when they went home hitchhiking or if they went to the dance uh, or to the movies, then they would wear the nice uniform, okay? And a lot of times the boys would come into camp, you know, to the town, local town, they'd wind up going to the dances and marrying the girls. Did that happen to your father? No. <laughs> so, so one lady came to my talk and she said, if it wasn't for the CCC, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> so I passed, and you see the stripes, okay? That would be, they'd be leaders and assistant leaders. I'll explain that. So I'll pass that. I was in the Putnam Library, and a guy said he, this was in his house when he bought it. He wanted it. Then another guy in Malone, where's Gary? You know where Malone, a northern New York, gave me his dress hat. And, okay, I don't want to show everything yet. But oh, where's the man? By the way, we'll get to the, the, the man with the something. I'll tell you. Uh, they, they lived in barracks, okay? Now, they had 200 guys per camp. Five barracks. How many boys per barracks? Four. How many? Four. Four? Four. Four. Anybody else? Correct. Gary, get 10 points on the next test. Okay, 40 guys, God bless you. And you had an army captain and a first lieutenant. How are they going to watch all of these boys, 18 to 25, 40 guys in a barracks? That's why what they did is, Gary, you're going to be the leader in barracks one. Okay? You've got to make sure the beds are made, the lights are out at 10 o'clock, the place is spick and span. Okay? This big guy here. What's your name? Tom, you're going to be his assistant. Gary, your leader, you get $45 a month. Everybody else in camp are getting a dollar a day. How much would they get paid for a month? $30, okay? 25 went straight home to the parents. $5 spending money for a month. That was it. So, Tom, you got $36 for being the assistant leader. Six extra bucks, that's a lot of money, okay? It's more, but you two guys had to take care of 38 guys. And then they had to see their boxes, and you'll come up here later on, you'll see that this was 1933, June 1933, the Cobalt Camp right below Portland in our little town of East Hampton. Our town was the only town in the state that had two camps. We had one, Salmon River, if you've ever been fishing there, Comstock Covered Bridge, and also uh, Cobalt. They were heated by a wood stove, and all they had were boards and tar paper. They had uh, vermiculite, or not vermiculite, what's this? Uh, Hummus over, like press board, that was the insulation. And you could imagine, you know, in the winter time when it was below zero, how cold it was. And you just had the floorboards, so you even had cracks there, the cold air coming. They were heated basically uh, by coal or wood. So they had to keep these fires going. And Mike, your job at camp, you'll be the night watchman. You had to walk 10 o'clock at night till 6 in the morning, make sure there's no problems. Make sure all the stoves are filled, etc., like that. That's one guy. That's all he had to do. Another guy, all he had to do is take care of cleaning the uh, bathroom, the t uh, toilets. Uh, where were these camps located? We know already. And there were three types or four types of camps. The first camp, basically, they were white. 
In Connecticut, we were integrated. Rhode Island was integrated. Massachusetts integrated. Pennsylvania, we had black camps and white camps. New York, right across the border, black camps and white camps. The third camp was what, professor of history? Well, veterans camps. Now, during 1932, when Hoover was president, we had these veterans called the Bonus Army. They were in World War I. They were promised a bonus in the 1940s. 32, they were suffering. They said, came to uh, Washington, we want our bonus now. Okay? And Hoover drove them out. General MacArthur drove them out. 1933, the Bonus Army came again, protested. Who did Roosevelt send to the camp? Starts with an E. No? Very good, Joyce. How did you know that? She said Eleanor. So she drove up in her limousine. What's the problem now? Oh, you don't have a job? I'll tell my husband. He's the president. He'll solve it. Now, if you're the president and you have protesters, like we have protesters in Washington, what would you do, Tom? Sit down. What's the problem, right? Or would you tell them they're jerks? Okay? That's what he did. So he founded veterans camps. So you had the youth camps, 18 to 25, single boys, they weren't married, out of school. Uh, veterans camps, there was one in Niantic the first year in Connecticut. Okay, next. Here's the hierarchy. You know, you had an army captain, and they were reserve officers, usually. Oh boy, that's good. What am I doing here? Boom, go back. Okay. Okay. Then you would have a junior officer, first, second lieutenant. They had each one had their own army doctor. Okay, company clerk. Some of the boys who knew typing, stenography, they kept all the records. And Gary and Joan. Did you get your records of your dad yet? They're from, they have them all in St. Louis. So anybody who has a, a dad, uncle, somebody in their family you need their records, I've got the papers too, the information where you could get the records. And then you know when, where, where they were. Some boys were just cooks. Out of those 200, one boy stayed in the uh, dispensary clinic. Then we had, I told you about the barracks leaders, uh, truck drivers, barber, somebody took care of the uh, laundry. Usually, the, at first, the boys did it. Then they saw that the boys only had eighth grade education, most of them. There were some college boys, too, graduates, that didn't have jobs. But they needed education. So at nighttime, they had classes at night. You didn't have to take them, but they encouraged you. In Rhode Island, I think by 1938, they said you had to take at least two classes. You're not going to sit down and, you know, do nothing. Get your elementary diploma. Get your high school diploma. Uh, go to Willimantic at night for vocational classes. Carpentry. Uh, next. So here is the dispensary. And here is the boy and the doctor. So, with 200 boys working with axes, saws, getting in fights, you know, there's always problems, okay? They had a dentist, too, went around. T biggest problem, pulling teeth, because the teeth were so bad, some of them, you know, with all the decay, okay? If it was really sick, they sent you to the nearest army hospital, Nobody ever knew this, this place. What's the nearest army hospital for Connecticut? Just six miles away in another state. Gary, you read the book. 
I was thinking, oh, what a genius. Then I remember you read the book. I sold him the book. Very good. Well, that's where they took them. They took them to New London, took them six miles to Ford Wright. But that first summer, there it is, they lived in tents, 1933. Then, the next couple months, they would hire carpenters. And this is the Voluntown camp, named after State Senator Lonegan. This first camp was named after President Roosevelt. A lot of the camps were named after professors, too. Forestry at uh, Yale, or even one, the governor. Uh, oh boy, what come to me? Da -da 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 -da. Get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, make your beds, and it better be right. One guy said, if it wasn't right, the captain would rip the bed apart and say, start all over again. Then you went, had your breakfast, you had the raising of the flag, checking to see if all guys were here. If you weren't, A-W-O-L, and it went on your record. Uh, then they needed somebody to take these boys into the woods. Now, what's your first name? Ernie. Ernie? All right, Ernie, say you're uh, a working in the forest. You're a logger. You don't have a job. Your wife here. Is that your wife? Good friend. We might be getting an engagement tonight here. I've got a couple extra rings here. <laughs> well, you know, well, we're making up the story. Ernie's wife, she says, get out of here. Get down to the camp. I heard they're hiring guys. They're looking for guys who work in the woods. So Ernie goes to the camp there. He becomes an LEM, local experience man. He's now paid money to take maybe 10 boys out in the woods, okay? Maybe he's thinning the forest, getting the dead wood, okay? Taking the trees that aren't that good, calling them, okay? And another guy, he might be masonry, making uh, chimneys or you know, chimneys at the park or fireplaces. Uh, what else? Building roads was another big thing. So local experienced men, and they would also work with uh, foresters, like Gary was a forester. Any other foresters here? No foresters. Right here. Forester. Oh, where do you work? Chinooksit State Forest. No. <laughs> do you run it? Don't run the facility there. He does silviculture work. Anybody know what silviculture? What, is what does silva mean? Pennsylvania. Pens woods. So you're working with the woods, thinning the forest, etc. Like that. Where did you go to school? University of Massachusetts. Oh, wow, University of Massachusetts. Now, do you work with Vinny, or Vinny's gone? Uh, Vinny was, uh, Vinny's moved on to uh, other places, but yeah, he was there for a while. Okay. Uh, okay, so they went off to work. They put in eight hours, hour out for lunch. There they are. This is the Union camp. They're getting loaded up in the trucks. The Army officers say, Whoo, boy, I got eight hours of quiet. They're all working in the woods. A few of the boys are still at the camp. The cooks stay there. The boys work in the office. Some are working with the blacksmith here, the tools, making things, uh, the truck drivers. Big, biggest thing they did was a lot of things building roads. We had to get that, that wood out. And also, the woods were, uh, the roads were important in case there was a fire, so we could get to put out the fires, okay? Uh, they also did recreation, like the toilet. Here they are. Uh, they needed gravel for the road. So look at here, with their shovels, loading up the trucks. No front-end loaders. Imagine that, the muscles. And imagine getting three meals a day. These boys put on muscle. Look, at here's the dam they built. So they were working with maybe an Italian uh, uh, mason. 
and they helped bring the stones, mix up the mortar, and he taught them how to build the dam. Let's see if I get this right. Then they had an hour after lunch, and they're there doing some of that silviculture work up at the top, and they'd hire a teamster, you know, to pull out the logs. Here they are uh, shoveling when it was snow, and if it got to below zero or 20 below zero, they didn't have to work. Or if it was a rainy day, they'd have to make it up on Saturday. If it was bad for two days, they, only, they always had Sunday off for sure. Then they got back to camp at four, the dinner bell rang, they lined up, and they could have as much as they wanted. Okay, six guys at a table, and this guy said, Marty, we stood three guys on each side, the sergeant, mess sergeant, would say a, a, a prayer, and he said, Marty, I, we'd be standing like this, looking for the biggest pork chop. <laughs> So you can just imagine how hungry these boys were, uh, you know, eating. Then they would go back to their barracks, okay, play some cards if they wanted to, or they could go to the rec hall. There they had ping pong, pool tables, okay, there's the uh, canteen. This guy was assistant leader, $36 a month, and he ordered the candy the cigarettes, pipe tobacco, shaving cream, you know, different things like that. There's a veterans camp. Here's a class in crafts. The boys would bring their instruments and start uh, bands, and they would do entertainment uh, one night a week, sometimes. Fun things. Uh, boxing was really popular. The money they made at the uh, canteen would pay for uniforms and they would play local CCC camps for local town teams. So they kept them busy on the weekends. They even had football. Uh, KP duty, if you were called and you had to peel potatoes. Uh, Sundays, a uh, chaplain, army chaplain might come and perform a service, or you might be able to go up on a truck to go to town. Here are the classes. So sometimes there's an art class, cooking class, photography class. Some of these, they had their own dark rooms. They, they learned how to uh, develop pictures. They had to teach these boys how to drive trucks. And with 18-year-olds, what do you have? Accidents, deaths, too, because of this. But there was another learning. Look at how many trucks in each camp army trucks and conservation trucks. So you had those uh, state body trucks where the boys would be sitting along the side on a bench. Really safe, right? If you were in an accident flipped over, bad. The truck driver and the LEM man would be there. Look at the boys. That's all they had to do, drive trucks. And where's our guy with the license plate? Want to pass this around? Want to tell them where you found it? I don't know where it came from. <laughs> it's always been around. It's oversized, and the upper left hand, upper right hand on the back of that, is the emblem for the CCC, issued in 1933, which was the beginning. And That's all? Now get this. Picture this it's, it's a Civilian Conservation Corps license plate. Well, it's not a license plate, but picture it being on one of these trucks. Yeah, okay. that's a license plate for the truck. Get this. It says, this driver is to drive safely. Oh, that's all I have. Okay, maybe they had it in the front. And you know, a policeman in town of Enfield could not give them a ticket because they were working for the government. Now, my buddy here, he started taking his pants off at the Enfield Library. But look what he showed me. We'll pass this around, and this is from Camp Roosevelt, and it has, you'll be able to see, uh, he found it at a yard sale or something, right? Flea market somewhere, I don't know where. It's unbelievable, and it has the camp number, so we'll pass this around. And what's your first name again? Tony. Tony. Okay, okay. 
So I find a lot of stuff. They had their own camp newspaper. There's the camp, the Philly newspaper, and they had a national newspaper. It came out once a month or once a week. News from the 48 states plus Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Boy, you people are falling asleep on me. Must be time to go. First camp was Roosevelt. And how much time do we have? Five minutes? Ten minutes. Okay, I gotta go fast now. So by the end of the year, in Connecticut, we had 15 camps. It was all based on population of the state. What state had the most population in 33 of the 48 states? New York. New York. They had 67 camps. It's huge, okay? Guess how many Rhode Island had? One. Four. <laughs> and by 35, they had six. But that was, that was it. Small. Now, the first camp was down here in Roosevelt. Now, your camp, the closest to you, would be Camp Britain in, uh, what's the name? Pequonic. How many know where Pequonic is? Windsor? Okay. And then over here is the one in Stafford. Graves is Union. So those are the ones I'm going to go very quickly now. Okay. So those are the camps. Okay. They also had uh, a group of boys at the government dock in New London. And these boys would bring supplies over from Fisher's Island. And if you got sick, one boy had appendicitis, they quickly took him to New London on the ferry, and he had his appendix out there on Fisher's Island. The boys in Rhode Island, they went to Fort... What's the one in Rhode Island, near Newport? Uh, Adams. Thank you, Fort Adams. Okay, and what about Massachusetts? Starts with a D, definitely. Okay, Evans. I have a Windsor camp. Now, I went to the historical site in Windsor. We don't know any CCC camp. I went to the experimental station. The guys there 40 years. I don't know of any CCC camp in Windsor. Yet it says on the book, Windsor at the experimental station uh, land. I was able to find it. It was a Quantic in 35. It was named after the bug man. For Rhode Island, for Rhode Island, Connecticut, Britain. Then I found a map. River Road, Hayden Station, Farmington River, the Camp, Bukwani. I went down there, Thrall's Tobacco Farm. You know where that is? Yeah. Joe Thrall. He says, yes, the camp was there. Look at the building. That was then. This is now. They still use the building. You know, for a uh, garage. Look at the, I found this one at the uh, museum uh, in Windsor. The buildings. Camp Britain. Uh, this gives the whole thing about how they did work at the uh, Masako. And where's, who's got it lives in, nobody lives in Shrewsbury. That was the policeman at the restaurant today. <laughs> I thought it was somebody here. Uh, but they did, uh, they did the pavilion there. Stratton Brook Street Park. Anybody ever go there? I couldn't figure out what camp worked there. Now, Joyce, tell them about what your job was. Youth Corps, and I worked in Gates, the YCC, Youth Conservation Corps, right. and I worked at Gay City State Park in Connecticut. And did you have, let's see, one of the projects. We did, did you have Carl Stan? Yeah. He wrote the introduction for my book. No, I'm pretty sure he was 
Yeah, he helped design that uh, gay city. Okay, and he was also at Park Hempstead. Anybody else work at YCC? And did you like working? I love it. Yeah, it's Wow. And now when I met Jody Rell, I said, Jody, you know how they had that? And she says, I'll try to start it. She says, believe it or not, my father was in the CCC, but he never told me anything. Jody Rell. So I told her how to get the records, but then I never heard from her after that, whether she ever found them. Uh, but they built that nice pavilion there. They helped uh, the town of Wilson during the flood. Uh, search uh, gypsy moths. They tried to, in the winter time, that's what they were looking for, these egg masses, and they would paint them with creosote. Uh, they even had farm programs with vegetable gardens, and here they even had raising pigs, or chickens, just to give the boys education, and then they could make some money. Here's their camp newspaper, the cover. And I was lucky, there's a place in Chicago that has the largest collection of CCC camp newspapers. And I was able to get them at the Yukon Library. They said you had to be a professor or a student. How did I get them? I asked a student to get them for me. <laughs> I still have his library card. Oh, uh, look at the camp. Isn't that something? 200 boys from all over the state. This guy, Ed Kelly, was from New Britain. I found him, I don't know, uh, he was in uh, Middlebury. His daughter was, uh, I guess, heard about it, and he had all these pictures. Now, there, here's what the camp looks like today. Uh, one building left, the rest are all cement buildings, and they use them for housing and migrant workers you know, from Jamaica, and they work on the tobacco. And then they go home for the winter. They don't see their families for nine months or so, 10 months. Uh, today, there is a, tr I, don't, I think it might be a school for autistic children there. Anybody know where that is? Later on, they took all of the camp buildings and made them into migrants, and they even made one of the buildings into a church for the migrants. Look at the legacy, Stratbrook, built by the CCCs. Where, the, the previous one where they had the special needs school, where yes. was that again? Where was that, what town? It's right below uh, the Paquonic. Paquonic. This is the one on the uh, Superall uh, area. Right, okay. right next to it, right. Yep. Thank you. Okay, then I've got the Natchai, but we're gonna go through fast with this one because we want to get to uh, look at the wood pile they had. Wow. See the car accident there? See that flipped over? The work crews. They built the bridge across the Natchaug River. They even had their own tennis court. Archery team. Look at the logs they took out to make forests. And that's the big guy, Austin Hawes. They built fire towers, and these are the buildings that are left. The garage, the trails, the guys that I met who worked there. Uh, Union Camp, it's right on Route 30, or wait, 190, right before you get to 84. And this is what it looked like. They did a lot of work in the forest there. There's Route 190. And there was, they used this as a fire tower, a lady's house there on, in the town of Union, 1912. There's their Nip Muck newspaper. The guys were, that I interviewed, they made uh, Mori Pond, you know where that is? This is a burning barrel made out of concrete. And if you've ever been Mount Laurel, they built that road through there, thinned it out, so that you could see the Mount Laurel, Bigelow Pond they did. This lady now owns the camp. That's what's left of it. 
And here's where Camp Connors now. This is right down Route 190 past the prison, Soapstone Mountain. This is the only building that's left, the administration building. You could see, look at the wood pile. Look at the coal pile. The boys had to get it, bring the stuff, the water. And it was named after General Fox Connor. He was in charge of all of New England camps. I was in Old Forge in the Adirondacks, and this guy came up to me and said, I'm General Fox's grandson. This guy was in his 80s. <laughs> so you never know. Uh, this was their washroom. S the supervisors, now some of these guys you might even know. The tower, building the roads. Soapstone Mountain Road. And you know the ranger place there? They built that one. It's now empty. Uh, the boys, the teams, acrobatics. Look at their dress going to camp, or uh, going into town of uh, Stafford Spring. But look at how neat this was, huh? At the end of the day, going to your rec hall, the fireplace is burning in the winter time. Look at the nice furniture, pool table. And their camp newspaper, the different classes that they had, carpentry, electricity, photography, look at the basketball team, there's the camp. These are the guys that I met. Then I met this guy, Ralph Sturgis. Anybody know him? Everybody should know him in this class. He was a poor boy from Norwich, where's our two Norwich people? Back there. And he went to uh, Camp Connor, went to World War II, GI Bill, college education, went to work to Philadelphia, came back to Norwich, and he founded Mohegan Sun. That amazing rags to riches. He was the head Indian chief. Isn't that amazing? I, the people I meet. Look at this guy, he had a leather class, he made his mother a purse, you know, leather. Uh, these are guys that went out west, and a lot of them, Colorado. This guy here, Joe, he said, after six months, his buddy said, we have a week off, let's go down to Mexico. They hopped the boxcars. After six months, hey, let's go to San Francisco. Hop the boxcars again. Imagine riding across the Rocky Mountains, on the top of a boxcar, going into San Francisco, and then losing your buddy in San Francisco, and going back by yourself. <laughs> this guy, he wound up head of the engineering department at University of New Haven. He had to drop out of school because his father left his mother with five kids. He had to quit school. Uh, here are some more guys that went to Colorado, New Hampshire, Pueblo, Colorado. So it cost the government $20 million just for Connecticut, but look what they did. They built bridges, planted millions of trees in Connecticut. They thinned our forest silviculture. Uh, they fought disease, like Dutch elm disease, cutting down the trees, uh, burning them up. They found out that if they could get rid of the gooseberries and the currant bushes, they were hosts for the fungus that caused blister rust. So if you eliminated currant bushes and gooseberries from 900 feet from a white pine forest, you would not have blister rust. So that's what, they don't even let you raise currants or gooseberries in the state, right? Or in the United States, because they're so worried about blister rust. Then they have the boys climbing up the trees, searching for these egg masses, for the caterpillars, and paint them with creosote. There they are climbing the trees, or putting burlap around them. They build roads. I was in Nakata yesterday, and the guy said, I know where that 
Water hole is. I'm sorry. Oh God, yes, I'm in Nagatuck. <laughs> Did you know what Nagatuck is famous for? Peter, Paul, all enjoy. They just pulled out of the, of the town six years ago. Mounds in the 1920s by this Greek. His name was Peter something or other. He called himself Peter Paul. Goodyear in the vulcanized rubber. Nagatuck. Okay. Flat fires. Built fire towers. Roads. Look at the parks they built. Roads. Uh, people's forest. Nice museum. They took the terrible wood, made uh, charcoal out of it. And look what I found. This was in Roosevelt, or Chat Chatfield Hollow, Roosevelt. They bagged it and sold it to campers. They made money. They made shingles. So they were able to take the wood out of the forest and make money for the state. They helped fight, uh, you know, helped people with, uh, during the floods of 36 and the hurricane of 38. When World War II came, we no longer needed those boys in the woods. We needed them to fight. And they were ready to go, as this gentleman said. Camps closed, never officially closed, but a lot of the buildings, most of the buildings were taken down, used for lumber, other parts of the state. Look at the legacy. How many been to Denver? Tell them about Red Rocks. Choice? No, the lady behind Yeah, I remember um, when my daughter lived in Denver for um, 10 years, so I made many trips to uh, Colorado. And I always said I wanted to do Easter service at Red Rocks, but it was always like 20 degrees, and we'd have to get up at 2 in the morning. But it's an amphitheater. Amphitheater, look at it, 10,000 seats built by the CCC. Took about four years to, for them to build it. I was there one night, Joe Cocker and Steve Miller Band. Under the stars, everybody having a ball. Oh, it is gorgeous. There's this big red rock here and a big red rock there, and they carved this out. All that cement they poured. Whoops. They also built uh, the Shenandoah uh, Skyline Drive. Look at the trees now that we have in our forest, the trails. How many been to Kent Falls? They built that, the trail going up. Housatonic Meadows, uh, Patchogue Forest by Ballantown. This is the one where we were trying to raise money to put a statue right over here. The boys built this huge dam. It was just this little stream. The size of the trees, 85 years old. We have a museum here, right down the road, threatening to close it down completely because of budget cuts. And hopefully it will be open at least one day a week. Look at the view. It's like one of the best museums in the United States. The guys we met, this is the statue. So if anybody would like to contribute to this fund, we're up to $9,500. We need $24,000. I was, I was in Waterford. Guy sent a check in for $250. I was in Niantic or Nagatuck yesterday. They gave me a check for $15. So if anybody who could help, Gary, could you pass this around to see if anybody would be interested? In, you could even make a check out today, make it to CC Legacy, and I'll mail it into Virginia. Uh, but anybody who would like to, so we have a statue. We're one of the, I think, only six states that don't have a statue honoring the CCCs. I think Massachusetts has one in Boston. Oh, going the wrong way. And my book is twenty nine ninety five. Took me eight years, five hundred forty four pages. Has a hundred guys that I've interviewed, thousand pictures. So, I, and then anybody's interested in this, and you know what? I need some help. My last thing. I'm starting a book about traveling to all the towns in Connecticut. One hundred sixty nine clubs. 
I have this. This is the Adirondack Hunter 2 Club. But I, I need somebody to write about Enfield. 550 words, if somebody could help me. Where it is, little history, and interesting places to visit in Enfield. And then you go around, and you get it stamped. It's a journal. And, oh, there's two. Then, if you do, in the Adirondacks, Gary, you become a member of the Vagabond Club. But so I'm trying to think of something for the state of Connecticut. Somebody's saying, well, it's the, what the kind of state it's the nutmeg state. Do you want to win the nutmeg award? <laughs> if you were a soccer player, you'd want to get nutmeg, right? <laughs> no, but I have a I, I, oak tree. Well, you know what? I found a guy in the 1800s who was the vagabond in Connecticut. Who was it? Leather man. So I'm thinking of the leather man award. And I've got a girl, she's designing something to see. So if anybody would like to help me with that, and, oh, wrong way. And here's my family. Oh. On Lake Pocatapog. My baby Ryan married Jenna from Stanford. My bachelor Matthew, 42, still waiting to find the right one. We got Vinny. My granddaughter Kira, who's going to be 12. Lydia, who's uh, 10 and a half. My wife Lynn. My daughter Christy. Matthew, my genius computer guy, and I'd like to thank the Historical Society for having me come, and I hope you know a little bit about the CCCs, and what a great organization, what they did. And class dismissed. <laughs>